Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the roundtable discussion on striking the right balance between scale, experience and security. This session is a part of the Economic Times BFSI Tech Leaders Roundtable Series powered by Akamai. I am Dimple Bajwa from ETH, welcoming you all to this session. In today's VUCA world, rising consumer expectations are disrupting every industry, especially those with a digital backbone. Leaders in the BFSI industry have been early adopters of leveraging technology to connect with their consumers and also in enabling their employees to carry out operations remotely. In the last 12 to 18 months, this trend has seen an upward shift with users and consumers of banking and financial services leveraging digital channels almost exclusively to conduct their financial transactions. With this surge in both consumers and uh, employees relying on digital channels to conduct their day-to-day -day, uh, operations, financial services organizations and institutions are faced with challenges related to balancing between upscaling, performance, and security. Every financial organization today is a part of an ecosystem of players that rely on each other to exchange business-critical data. With the growing usage of apps and APIs and the emergence of open banking platforms, today cybersecurity is one of the most important challenges that banking and financial services organizations must address. We now see that more and more data privacy and security are fundamental building blocks of organizations. In today's roundtable session, we bring together exceptional leaders and experts from the fintech sector who will share their perceptions and experiences on how to strike the right balance between scale, experience, and security. Our speakers will touch upon some important topics during the session, such as the role of emerging technologies such as cloud, edge, IoT, 5G in providing scale and performance of services. Building digital trust in times of digital disruption. Delivering superior US, UX as the omni-channel consumption in more than ever before. And securing user and partner data by securing APIs. To shed more light on the same, we have with us today Ashish Anantraman, CIO, Zest Money, Shantanu, CTO, Payu, Piyush Ranjan, CTO, Cover for, Karan Mehta, Co-Founder and CTO, Kisht, Nishchal, Founder, Vazirex, Siddharth Pisharoti, RVP, India and uh, Southeast Asia Akamai Technologies. And to moderate the session, we have Biswajit Das, Director, Lighthouse Analytics, AI and Data, KPMG India. Without further ado, I would now hand over the baton of, of this session to Biswa. Over to you, Biswa. Thank you so much, Dimple. It's always a pleasure to be here. It's great to see all of you, right? It's been a while, I'm guessing. Uh, interesting bit of topic today, right? I mean, the six degrees of separation, the traditional six degrees of separation between humans has shrunk now. And, and businesses always mimic human behavior. And I think the only job of technology is to amplify human capabilities. So it all, it's all about making it faster, more convenient, better integrated for both internal as well as external consumers. And the rise of mobility and digital initiatives have only accentuated the need for bringing together what could have started as isolated initiatives to become bigger, better, and faster. Obviously, this is easier said than done. And to speak of how to go about striking this balance, like Dimple said, between scale, experience, and security, we have today uh, with us panelists who are hyper-connected natives, so to speak, right? And while all businesses are directly or indirectly aimed at wealth creation, in other words, making money, their business literally is money, right? Because if you go to any forum today, more often than not, we are either speaking about finance or about technology. And for all the panelists that we have today, their BAU itself is right in the Venn diagram intersection of both finance and technology which we are very creatively christened fintech, of course. And, and, and there's this new breed. I was talking yesterday, I was talking to someone yesterday, I said there's this new breed of no suit, no tie, no stiff upper lip, and in many cases, no brick and mortar financiers and bankers of, of today, right? Uh, so let's get started. Shantanu, I wanted to come to you first, because uh, I think everything is around 
customer in the center today or human in the center today you have a lot of experience around customer first platforms whether it was e-commerce omni channel transportation for many many fortune 100 companies right whether walmart yahoo dell and now of course pay you right i don't know if all of us know this but shantanu actually has four patents to his name shantanu you want to tell us a quick 30 seconds bit on those four patents what's all that about so thank you vasu uh, and uh, uh, of course uh, appreciate such a kind words and for this kind of welcome well uh, these patents are about how we can uh, streamline the way customers uh, you know do the purchase on the websites as simple as that and from 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 that angle i will start this discussion because you rightly said that it's all about customer right whether wherever we go everything is revolved around customer correct and i will now go one step further and link it with our today's uh, connect uh, and thank you uh, dimple to for that introduction for all of us you know you know who is a customer actually all of us in this room are customer everyone on the planet is a customer and that's where uh, it's a very basic fundamental gaining anyone's trust forget customer gaining anyone's trust in today's world not just in a proposition of a business products or offerings or a services or an organization offerings or services but in core purpose and principles is actually fundamental to ethos of life and that's how i would want to start and begin with my uh, discussion basu today about the trust and very interesting factor which has happened is as and more and more we are you know with the advancement and advent of this digital technology right and actually last uh, unfortunate event which has happened uh, unforeseen century event of this pandemic you know what we have seen is the transformation of digital technology even where it was 2 3 years down the line scheduled to be slated it has moved at an exponential pace and many new upcoming businesses and you know industries have picked up to the onboarding or they have you know come to this bandwagon of digital technology and businesses have been asking and what it has resulted is now businesses have been asking customers which is like people like you me and everyone our parents our friends out there in the society people who we work for people whom they we associate with to you know businesses are asking customers to trust them in new and you know more innovative and deeper ways there is a lot of personal information being asked for there is a lot of personal information is being tracked with the online behavior with multiple kind of digital breadcrumbs and the intent is of course not snooping or something but the intent is how we make this whole thing seamless and effortless for customer but unfortunately you know everything comes at the cost we realize that all these things which we do for making the seamless journey of a customer what it results into other effects caveats like there are security hacks inappropriate or we just heard uh, pegasus uh, scam illegal surveillances uh, misuse of personal data we have seen the spread or you know uh, fake news you can see misinformations even the algorithms which are implemented there you can see a bias in those algorithms and of course lack of transparency it is becoming a trend of the world right so the right balance between how we make the thing simple for our customers seamless frictionless and at the same time ensure that the trust of our you know customer like you and me and all of us in this room and in the world is not lost because the resulting distrust actually cause a you know of course loss to the business but much more than the loss it is like you know tarnish the image of the organizations where we are working in and what i will say uh, basu to uh, just uh, summarize my discussion and that's where in today's world four fundamental principles of trust are needed across the globe whether it is an any organization working in any kind of industry and i will just summarize them what we need today more than any 
time we needed it is transparency and accessibility of what organizations do. Of course, the second one, we, we need security and reliability. That is for, you know, without, uh, you know, mentioning. The third is the privacy and control, Basu. And last but the not the least, I will say, ethics and responsibility of everyone involved in this. So if we abide ourselves by these four fundamental principles of trust, I will repeat the transparency, the security and reliability, the privacy and control of the information, and last but not the least, being accountable, ethics and responsibility. I think we will be able to, you know, make uh, trust again a known figure for all of us in this world. I, I absolutely, Shantanu, I, I absolutely resonate with what you're saying because so I keep getting asked this, right? In the absence of a massive privacy bill that is going to come and in some form of shame in India, right? But for the last few years, we've been having this debate. Wherever I go, people will ask me, how do you ensure trust in this area of digital disruption, right? And, and my initial answer would always be, in the old days, there used to be this ethics of reciprocity, right? Only do unto others what you would be okay others will want to do. But unfortunately, I don't think uh, you know, a lot of businesses will still throw that line. Thankfully, there are, uh, I think now there are frameworks, toolkits, platforms, which allow us to do all of these four things that you're talking about, right? How to be transparent, not only when it's convenient, but also when it's inconvenient. How to have this entire thing, which is secure, reliable, private, within your control. And, but of course, ethics is still, while others can come and give you guidelines and frameworks, etc., it's still a very internal decision to an organization right so we'll come back we'll come back to this because i think this is a this is a very heated debate right now right right from davos to everybody to talk about ai ethics in ai and ethics in business etc i quickly wanted to jump to uh piyush piyush you are as tech native as it gets i mean and as you have been coding what since the age of 10 i guess right and i was probably learning how to peel a banana at the same age so, so, you know, a self-taught coder, and you have also been a propagator of self-service in all other areas. And this has now transcended business boundaries uh, in this entire customer-first economy to be able to empower and enable the customer to be able to do self-service, right? How, does, how has this translated uh, in your experience in the insurance industry? I think in the insurance industry, and thank you for the uh, thank you for the uh, nice introduction. I I I was also learning uh, to peel bananas and still learning to code <laughs> because I was a little bit passionate about it. But uh, self service, I feel, is 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 uh, is something that is becoming um, prevalent has become prevalent in most of the other industries. Are becoming uh, prevalent in most of the industry. In in uh, BFSI, it it is a it is a little slower process because of stringent guidelines and and the uh, the, um, the production themselves being very very uh, complicated. Specifically in in the case of insurance, um, the the products are a little hard to understand. It's it's uh, it's a little difficult for uh, people because there's so many parameters. It's it's uh, it probably takes a PhD to understand uh, a, a complicated insurance product, but. I see that um, um, manufacturers, the intermediaries like like us and and um, everyone involved in the ecosystem has realized that this is the way to go, and uh, the more and more focus is now going online. But it's it's not just that you can take an offline product and slap online web page on top of it or a buying process on top of it, and it will become online. You the product inherently has to uh, be friendly and should lend itself to. To, to be to be bought uh, in an online manner. Just to give you an example, as soon as the pandemic struck, for some time, the, obviously the, there was a wide disruption. But motor industry, which is which is the primary uh, insurance uh, general insurance uh, product, uh, picked up very nicely because there were um, uh, you know uh, they they were already initiatives to make it mostly online, and as um, a pandemic, um, uh, you know, pandemic rolled out, and um, uh, the first wave and the second wave, it 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 has become completely online. It, it there is no need for anybody to uh, even even in break-in cases where the the policy has already expired, and you need in earlier days you used to have an inspector coming to your house and do 
online now you can do all of it on phone do you, you have an app you, uh, you you can download that app you can do your own self inspection and the policy will get uh, activated immediately in in a, in a couple of minutes so so that process uh, uh, in 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 health in, in the, the same process in for instance health and term industry the insurance industrial also products have, have also started happening in the life insurance there uh, uh, industry that people have also understood that you know uh, doing um, lab checks where people other people are going for corona test is is something that is completely a no no right for a normal customer so so a lot of uh, uh, pre underwritten or white listed products have come into market uh, health insurance has also lend itself very well to e consultation like normal physician uh, you know uh, visits have reduced in in, in most of them has moved to e consultation or video consultation a lot of the uh, medical checks have also become completely uh, either uh, video consultations or at home tests where somebody comes in and takes uh, the the samples from home so so all of these things together in in insurance industry what has happened is that it has uh, transformed itself into a digital native uh, and and we, i feel that this is just scratching the surface there just like in the banking industry in insurance also the the unbundling of the product will happen because by unbundling products you make the, they make them simple you don't have to understand all these five or 10 products that you have bundled together and one person need to understand and take a decision a large decision to to buy that one product it it becomes a smaller product and it becomes a more unidirectional product parameters are simple and users are able to understand so unbundling of insurance is also happening the more smaller products are coming to play corona policies you know you have heart attack and cancer policies you have you have the personal accident cover you have critical illness and more and more we are seeing that these add ons the what you what used to be an add on to a actual large policy now are getting sold individually so so what is what what is called as a you know a, a, a penny policy or a small policy that that is getting sold more and more in micro insurance it is getting sold uh, in more and more independently and and in a in a stand alone manner not just as a uh, cross sell um, or up sell product so so i feel insurance banking lending all of these industries have a long way to go insurance will be probably the probably lag a little bit but it it will be the most disrupted it will be the most uh, uh, most innovation will come out from 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 insurance be, be aware of this fact that india has the lowest uh, gdp to uh, uh, coverage ratio they we are the least insured country uh, in, in 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 any major economy and th that has to change if, if the lives of people have have become more um, uh, valuable the, the 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 dependency on of others on you is is more the assets that we are buying are more expensive so, so we need to start buying more and more insurance so by doing all of this uh, uh, insurance industry is changing itself and becoming more customer friendly like shantanu so, uh, yes so pipish i i will like so i remember a couple of years ago i i did a series of talks on the unbundling of big banks right and how 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 fintech players were going about slicing very thin slices of particular and i would take a bank's website and tell them who is slicing or what parts of the bank's product portfolio and something similar is happening to insurance and even faster i remember in the, i don't know if i'm sure you're aware and financials who had this entire obviously much larger ecosystem they used to have this insurance platform i remember they used to have when we talk about micro insurance right they used to have this friday evening insurance so if you're going out to town for a party on friday evening you would actually take an insurance so that if you got drunk and you had an accident etc they would cover it just for one day right yes. similar things happening in india now you can take a daily motor insurance so if you are if you only go out once a week why do i need insurance for the other six days and now you can actually just take insurance for the day that you want and i think but the from a technology point of view right and i will come back to you uh, once we sort of go to some of the other speakers but something for you to think about which is that this gen now what it means is there are now multiple partners who have become a part of the same ecosystem but fulfillment needs to be faster right which is a dichotomy so now there are more data hops 
fulfillment needs to be faster and the threats have increased. So how, what sort of framework we look at is something that we'll come back to if you can talk about. I quickly wanted to jump to current, current like Piyush, you are also very hands-on to technology and, and I hear and I would love to at some point of time come and physically see that you've done almost Tony Stark sort of a thing at your home where you now have an absolute AI based automated home. So we'd love to come and see and hear about that. But coming back to topic, Karan, I think one of the biggest upside of digital has been how inclusive it has enabled businesses to be. I mean, moving out of Metro India to have adoption in every corner of the country, breaking the India Bharat divide, so to speak, right? Have you seen this first time that case? No, no, absolutely. So one of the biggest revelations for me, I've been in the lending industry for the past five years. Uh, and when I look at the days we had uh, five years ago, we used to have reams and reams of paper that used to come into our offices from the 50, 60 cities you were live in. Every partnership we used to do with a big e com player or any merchant that be like this long debate about what is the paperwork we'll do, what are the documents you want, what, what is the KYC. Uh, but one of the stark changes that has happened over the last five years, right? And it's just a confluence of a lot of good events. Uh, Aadhaar became almost universally accessible. Uh, every Indian is almost guaranteed to have a smartphone with a 4G connection, unheard of three years ago, uh, and just a reality today. People have even become tech savvy in using something as simple as just the fact that people have started using WhatsApp a lot more regularly has gotten them this confidence that, okay, they can use other apps too. And you're talking about people in all corners of India. And all of a sudden in the last three years for us, the geographical divide has evaporated. We used to be present in some 60 cities. And for us uh, as a small uh, fintech company, even 60 cities was a massive stretch. It meant having sales and collections people in 60 cities. Uh, every every city we would open up, we'd have to look at data for uh, six months just to see whether you know we need to uh, focus on that one pocket or not. But all of a sudden, just the confluence of eKYC, uh, digital footprint from uh, mobile phones, easy access to internet, and most importantly, customers becoming tech savvy, whether they realize or not. You don't need tech savvy in the form of wanting to use some you know complicated apps. Just the fact that they can use WhatsApp, just that knowledge you're able to translate into getting them to do a loan from uh, apps or open a bank account or get an insurance product, right? And this has been a revelation. If I draw, we have, uh, we use a tool called Kepler, which allows us to plot uh, loans across India. And uh, the first three months, uh, first three years of Kish is just six uh, big uh, towers, 60 big towers in the cities you're live in. And right now, when I plot it every day, it's covering every single square inch of there. We have customers from Leeradak, we have customers from Andaman, we have customers from Lakshadweep. And it just makes me proud that, okay, you know what, you created a product, you've gotten out to, out to the customers, but now you're actually bringing it to every single Indian. Uh, and just there is a power. This power has purely been unleashed because of digital. Uh, there is absolutely no way in 60 years we could have done this if we were following the processes we are. And here, I mean, I give a massive, massive amount of credit to the, you know, the regulatory infrastructure, the government uh, uh, vision and the foresight that they've put into a lot of things, they're all literally coming together. And uh, one of, uh, I mean, one of the good examples is I was hearing Shantanu speak, I heard uh, Piyush uh, speak. And one of the things I realized, I'm we are technically a lender, Kist is a lender. But uh, over the past uh, three years, we are actually doing a lot, 80% of our payment processing we are doing ourselves because of UPI. So, uh, while PGs used to do payment processing 100% about three years ago, UPI has actually made that decent place. So KIST is now also a major payment processor by itself. Uh, we KIST got an insurance license. We are actually now also doing uh, bite-size insurance. The bite-size insurance that Piyush is talking about, we are able to do them ourselves. Uh, and so on and so forth. I think what is what the digital nature of the ecosystem has brought about is almost everyone is able to do a lot of things that originally were not in their... Uh, you know, not in their forte and it's opening up a lot of possibilities. Customers will come to one app and be able to do multiple transactions and the ecosystem will actually evolve and become healthier over time. And uh, I mean, one of the thoughts I've always had is the government has put out a lot of these building blocks for us. Uh, for us, the fintechs that are there, the startups that are going to come up. Uh, now it's actually two players like us to take those building blocks and create uh, incredible products going forward. Uh, yeah, I, I, so this is, Thank you for bringing this one thing up because I think in our favorite national pastime of government bashing, that doesn't matter which government is in power, right? That's one of the things that we do. I think we sometimes lose sight of the fact of the tremendous change that universal Aadhaar 
UPI, some of these fundamental building blocks to how we actually do business Correct. and how it is all. You couldn't think of KYC or digital lending without an Aadhaar intent. Absolutely. Right? Uh, you couldn't think of instant money back without UPI intent and so on and so forth. Right? I mean, uh, that it has enabled all of all of this and especially, for example, for microfinance, right? And even for micro insurance. I think one of the irony of, this, of these sectors was that the people who really needed the most had the least access to all of this because the, you couldn't open an office in a distant cow somewhere where you would have possibly five customers in a year. It just wasn't financially viable. Now you are able to go. So simply because entire rural India leapfrogged the digital evolution, right? They didn't go desktop, desktop, mobile. They went mobile first and mobile primary. Right. And they are very, like you said, while our concept of tech savvy is different, right. but actually they are technology savvy. I know folks who uh, walk into my house and the first thing they ask for is Wi-Fi connected, right? And these are not folks who you would peg as technology evangelists, etc. So I, I think very interesting. I'm going to come back to because all of this has, this is the good side of it, right? It also has a more complex side of how do you actually hold it all together and keep it safe. So we will come back for that. I quickly wanted to jump to Ashish. Ashish, you have had fun during a very checkered career, right? You've, you've worked with large global game, the large global gaming industry as well as the financial sectors, right? Including building and launching many, uh, what you call buy now, pay later products, including of course now with rest money. And one of the crossovers between gaming and other sectors uh, would be the importance of the user experience and how it actually impacts consumption patterns, right? And I should be, I think it would be interesting for all of us to see what you make of that, uh, how you made that crossover, Ashish. Sure, yeah, first of all, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so customers, now what happens when it comes to customers is they are always there to surprise you. You would think of doing something, building something for them. Of course, all the, you know, you do it in collaboration, you kind of speak to them a lot, um, understand their requirements, you do a lot of research, uh, you do a lot of experiments, but still at the end of the day, they manage to kind of uh, surprise you in, in multiple ways. So whether it is a, you know, uh, an experience for a customer, whether it is on online betting or when they are shopping or when they are banking or when they are, let's say, using a healthcare, it's very important that you keep, you pay a lot of attention to the user experience that they are expecting to kind of uh, want to kind of experience. Um, so there are a lot of studies that has gone in in terms of how can you keep your customer interested in the product and thereby have that brand loyalty. And at the same time, giving them a lot of value in, and how long can you maintain interest of the customer whilst they are having a transaction or whilst they are on terms of uh, to continue to use them. It's very easy nowadays, given you know the you know any of your property, be it on your website or using your app and so on and so forth. So, uh, kind of apps that is existing out there, any of the apps that doesn't get used, keep them for engaged one to continue to use your application and use your for a period that gets announced. And you are like you're literally losing your customer there. So user experience is something which is very, very important. And you know, we, we spoke about uh, you know the, the world moving towards an omnichannel user experience. I want to kind of spend a couple of minutes talking about that. Now, omnichannel experience in particular when it comes to the user experience is quite big in banking and healthcare. I feel those are the two um, good use cases where an omni-channel US comes kind of come, kind of comes into play. And India was already set once the digitalization in India started happening. And as Karan mentioned about you know the, the good that the government has done in terms of India on the back, we are in, in poor course of you know moving in that direction. But then Due to COVID, I think the whole process is now kind of accelerated. And especially the customers have been very much, it has been a difficult task for them to be really honest, but they have been like through that. So for companies much uh, interested or very keen shoppers of you know, brick and mortar 
uh, set uh, who are into the space, especially the binoculars, or kind of craze term used up for them to go back and or probably start shopping online and then globally. It's very important for brands and companies to build an UX by missing out on the instances of filling the purchase or making the transaction where it is seamless experience of this omni-channel, you know, across the different worlds of whether it be online and digital and completely offline. So that's where I think the power of technology has come to a great extent where you are in a position to provide that a uh, seamless experience for customers. Now, when it comes to um, gaming, uh, it, it's very simple. Yes, there is a risk of you losing the customer if the experience is not that great, if the user experience is not that great. But it's something which is more for an entertainment. It is not a necessity per se, and it is not much a necessity in India. But when it comes to paying banking or healthcare, it has now become very, very important because if you're not going to do it online, probably because of the current situation, you will not be able to complete your shopping or complete your banking in the way you want to, um, or your health care is going to get, gonna, your health uh, needs are going to take a hit. So hence, building that user experience is like super, super, very important. Now, there are a lot of things that companies can do in terms of you know, building that or enhancing that experience. Now, when I said that, that omni-channel experience is so important and by holding them, by, you know, using their hand and then taking them through that experience, which is if you want to take an offline customer and moving them into the online, it is only important for them to feel that, get the comfort that once things get better, they'll be able to continue to shop around, in, you know, in the shops, but still can continue using your product. And at the same time, at a, at a space, place where there are multiple devices that comes into play. It is very important to maintain that user experience across multiple devices as well. So a lot of technology, a lot of thought has gone in, a lot of experiments has gone in, a lot of actions, has, a lot of networks has been built specifically to build this uh, experience, this omni-channel user experience for the customers so that you know they continue to stick with you for as long as you want them to as long as they can otherwise you know someone else will come and do that for them and another important part for the user experience is uh, the whole digitization that has happened in india has been built on some solidly built uh, rails whether it is in the form of a upi or the qr code scan which kind of enable these transactions to happen in a jiffy Whenever you're bringing up these new omni-channel user experience, we need to make sure that you're not introducing something very new to, to the consumers. Most of the consumers are tech savvy, agreed, but still any of the new change that you're going to bring in is gonna have some kind of a learning curve for them. And that's where you kind of tend to, you're, you, you're likely to see a drop off. Hence, as a part of the whole user experience um, thing that you're building for the customers, you need to use new innovative, products or features to slowly kind of uh, uh, educate the customers and take it over. Use e existing stuff wherever you can to the maximum extent. I'm not saying don't use innovation, but that is what I would say. Uh, absolutely. I like the thought. Uh, don't do new for new sake. Uh, familiarity. But at the same time, you need to kind of find a balance between the two where you make use of the existing rail has, especially if you need mass adoption, familiarity. Still plays an important role, and and I keep saying this, right? Is using the existing frameworks and the technologies that exist out there, but at the same time bringing some. Today, people might have had to shift, been forced to shift to online uh, for what they were doing offline before because of the situation. This is an opportunity, right? This is an opportunity because you have the opportunity to replace what they're not getting, which is touch and feel and that personal trust that they had with the vendor. But you have to replace it with something. It, it can be convenience, it can be some something else, choice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because at some point of time, and fingers crossed, at some point of time, we will go back to normal. They will have the choice, and for you to retain them, still doing what 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 they're doing today on your online platform, you will have to give them something that they are not getting offline, and that's all about the experience, right? And and, and I absolutely agree uh, agree with what you're saying, right? Uh, but this has its own bit of challenges. And Sid, I wanted to bring you in here. Many years now, you've been partnering uh, financial organizations, services organizations uh, on their entire, to enable them to sort of develop, scale, and secure their products and ecosystems, Sid, right? 
and and for financial service organization data is the actual currency because they capture not only personal information but also a lot of financial data in history of users what are some of the threats that these institutions face today how can they counter them successfully so you know as you said right at, at akamai we are an integral part of the digital ecosystem we secure and deliver digital experiences uh, across the globe uh, work with some of the largest companies including some of the leading banks and financial uh, services companies um before i actually get into the you know answering that question couple of data points uh, you know uh, like to start with for us to think about right one the security um, has become the single biggest challenge for for anybody right um if you look at the cost of cyber crime it's kind of increasing at a very alarming rate uh, it's increasing at you know 15% year over year studies say that cost of cyber crime will touch about 10.5 trillion dollars by 2025 um and within that cyber security uh, realm the financial services sector in particular is a top choice of for, for attackers um and this is it's very straightforward right the motivation is financial uh, so it's uh, it's the most uh, you know sought after uh, sector to go after and just from our perspective we saw and we were able to kind of block about 193 billion you know credential stuffing attacks that target you know user credentials um which in 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 2020 which represented a 45% growth year over year from 2019 to 20 so what i'm trying to say is that as we just heard that the pandemic has spurred on the businesses and the pandemic has actually helped the businesses to do more uh the attackers are also increasing the number of attacks the number of accounts that are being compromised the data that is going to be comp- uh, that is getting compromised um and not just credential stuffing right we've seen attacks on applications and apis grow by 62% uh we've observed web attacks grow you know significantly and the last data point is interestingly india featured in the top 3 countries globally uh, that face these attacks so uh, not something not a statistic you know we we should be you know very happy about but uh, it is happening and the reason also is because uh, you know shantanu spoke about customer trust right and the 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 issue is when it comes to people's money right the single biggest thing is is trust and you only have one opportunity uh, you can only go wrong once because one even if you go wrong once you know you're going to lose that customer trust and you know tying back to what piyush mentioned in terms of we being a least insured country now think about you know if all the people in the country the, the 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 people who are not insured actually now getting on the digital platform there's a huge upside in terms of going after you know those folks who are not there but think about the scale that the platform has to go and then the scale of you know potentially the threats that can come with that so as much as you know i think the the whole digitization has helped and it's fantastic for us as an economy Uh, on the flip side you know we also have to protect ourselves uh, you know against the the threats that are coming up and i think just going to the second part of what i wanted to cover which is look in terms of cyber threats they are growing right i mean it's a known thing not just by volume but even the variety of the attack vectors that we're seeing and i think the in, from our vantage point what where what we are seeing is that as more and more apps talk to each other right and as there are a lot more api traffic that's you know connecting different applications to each other uh, that is becoming the single biggest you know uh, vulner- vulnerable area and we are seeing that attackers are targeting that targeting these apis you know significantly more than they are targeting let's say applications or any other thing and hence you know uh, and this is significantly again increased in the pandemic and uh, because the pandemic was unexpected none of us were expecting it uh nobody was prepared for it right so all of a sudden everything became digital right you couldn't go to a bank or you couldn't transact with somebody in person everything had to be done on your mobile phone we heard how now insurance is all self right you you take your own you know you do the self assessment take the pictures upload it you get the insurance none of us were prepared for that right i mean i'm sure nobody was thinking that we get to that level yes we knew that in the metros and where elsewhere people were doing that but we were not ready to do that across and what that has caused is that we had to get products much faster into the market when i say we i mean the industry than you know 
what was expected earlier. And hence, your focus completely is giving the best user experience, not so much on security. And I think somewhere there, security also had got kind of you know deprioritized. And what I you know summarize by saying is that I think the industry needs to embrace the new security architecture. Um, the edge is kind of the future, uh, and whatever your architecture be, uh, you know you have to look at you know extending the perimeter. The perimeter is just not your infrastructure now. The perimeter actually is people's homes and their mobile phones. Uh, and that last mile data connectivity that they're coming from. And uh, that's something that I think as an ecosystem, uh, as, a, as an industry, we all need to start looking at. You know, so. so I, I absolutely say that I think so this, this is the dichotomy of it, right? I mean, we are, we are seeing an exponential increase in the number of transactions. And I look at each hop as a transaction, right? Yeah. Wherever you go, especially more so in the fintech sector, but wherever you go, it's the same, right? And because we were doing it very quickly, like you said, we cobbled together. We also bought in new partners because we suddenly realized, okay, I'm a fintech guy. Do I have the expertise to actually uh, take my uh, on ground? You know, you would have this verification process, physical verification. How do I take it offline? You said, okay, there's a partner who can do it for me. You can do EKYC. So you bought him in, and then you figured out somebody else to do fulfillment and so on and so forth. So now. There are multiple hops that the data needs to go yeah. in API and our entire business is sitting on this foundation actually right now. And that is also the weakest uh, link in the entire chain, right? And that's where, and the only other thing is for any other business, if you scale from uh, 50 to 100, right? You would probably, the jump in complexity is incremental, right? In right. this case, it's exponential and it actually changes the nature of complexity. So sometimes you might have to throw, throw away the old framework and actually get a brand new framework and say, okay, this is the one for this scale, this is what I need, right? So on, on that, on that note, I wanted to bring Nischel in. Nischel, I have kept you for last because of course you are somewhat of a celebrity in the crypto space, right? And, and with your entire, I love your Twitter campaigns in India. India wants crypto. You have, I think, what, close to 300,000 followers now, if I'm not wrong. Uh, you have, of yeah. course, been on the Forbes 30 under 30, uh, which is not surprising given that your last company you started before was X was actually Crowdfire, right? A social media management organization. So, of course, right up there. But crypto, in, for many in the general population, environment around this in India. Sure. Um, yeah, I think I would like to start with first, uh, when I was hearing everyone speak, I realized that uh, probably I'm the one on the other side of the spectrum where uh, it's still unregulated and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's something new where there's no framework or guideline in place. Um, while it has both advantages and its disadvantages, the, the advantages you can just innovate, you know, you don't have to really um, look at the rule books as such, except for uh, some of the basic hygiene. Uh, but the disadvantages, and uh, that's been a large part in India, it's been hard for this industry is uh, not not being regulated as sometimes, uh, for example, people think it's illegal. Uh, and, I, and I've spent three years, the last three years of my campaign, just telling people it's not illegal. Uh, it, it's, it's very similar to the internet. The internet was never uh, something that was created with regulation in mind, it just came about. Uh, but because it didn't deal with money, nobody had to question it. And here you have crypto which deals with money. And uh, anything with money, we are just so used to regulations around it that uh, you know it's just hard for a new industry to emerge. But what I'm happy about is like the, the pandemic, for example, I think uh, that sort of uh, crypto was primed for it. If you look at uh, the crypto ecosystem, uh, I know you say it's mythical, uh, it, 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 but it's a lot like the early days of the internet. You know, the internet, when it started, uh, it started without identity, without, uh, uh, you know, a lot of understanding. Uh, to give you an idea, when, when I first uh, tried to buy something on, online and way back, I was uh, like 15 years ago when e-commerce was still new, I think. Uh, I bought something and I got a fake product and I, I thought the internet was a scam. And uh, for a long time, I did not buy anything on the internet. Um, so crypto is going through that phase of new where, you know, you could build what you want. Uh, but there will also be bad actors. 
And uh, one of the reason why I'm pushing for my campaign that you talk, spoke about, where the objective is every day I tweet about what crypto is, uh, you know, uh, dispelling some myth, is so that bad actors are identified early in the ecosystem, and uh, you know the government can bring in regulations sooner. Um, I think one of the biggest misconception people think is the term cryptocurrency itself. Um, and I, I'm glad that Siddharth uh, spoke about how data is a new currency. Uh, when, when he says that, we don't really start thinking about it competing with the INR. But for some reason, the moment you hear the term cryptocurrency, you start thinking it's going to compete with the dollar or the INR. Uh, it, it can't be different um, because when, when you think of INR, it's built for an offline world where you know you go to the to a shop you buy uh, you do something in the physical world you do it and you use the INR. cryptos they are they're completely built for a digital ecosystem uh, where the term blockchain that you've heard of is in use so so the term cryptocurrency actually emerged because you to use a blockchain you needed a currency but unfortunately what has happened is uh, different narratives have sort of you know changed the perspective to those who are not in the ecosystem and that's one of the biggest myth I would always dispel is that just because the term cryptocurrency does not mean it's here to compete with, let's say, your fiat currencies like INR or dollar. It's, it's a currency that is to be used in its own ecosystem. Um, now, to get a mental model of what crypto exactly is, uh, and, and I don't want to go too deep, is uh, if you look at the internet, the internet is just a network of information. Uh, that's what it is. And this network of information has led to all of the utilities that are built. The crypto, it's a network of value. So you, before crypto, you did not have a value network online. And what crypto does it, it just has created a network of value. And I can send value from one computer to the other. Just like I can send information from one computer to the other for internet, I can send value today for the first time with Bitcoin's invention. One could send value from one computer to the other. Now, everything that is getting built today in this ecosystem is an application on top of it. And uh, it's early days. Uh, you know, one of the questions people ask is, okay, we hear about the ecosystem growing so much. Like today, the, the value of the uh, crypto ecosystem is about $2 trillion. Uh, people say it's so valued so highly. Where are the use cases? Now, now that's, that's a lot like asking in 1992, what are the use cases of the internet? You know, you need to let it uh, breathe. And you need to let more people come in. Today, uh, I, I, uh, some numbers, just to get an idea. Uh, in India, there are about 15 million people who are into crypto. And uh, they hold about uh, uh, $2 billion, uh, about 15 to 20,000 crore worth of uh, crypto assets. In the grand scheme of things, on the internet, there are about uh, 4.75 billion people. Um, so if you think about the size of the crypto ecosystem, it's still very nascent, still very small. And, uh, you know, but the good thing is, this is our opportunity to be early movers. What I like about being in this sector is I miss the internet wave, you know, miss the wave where I could be one of those early movers and build whatever I wanted and register all those amazing domain names that existed so that I could sell them later. But right now I got, got this second opportunity where I can be an early mover. And uh, that's, that's one of the reasons why I think uh, the youth of the country today are uh, trying to get into the sector because the best thing is you don't need 10, 20 years of experience in crypto. You won't find someone with 20 years of experience in crypto. Everyone's new. So it's like a level playing field, whether you're a 20 year old or a 30 or a 40 year old. And I think uh, that's the reason why 60, I think 60, 70% of our audiences are in the 20 to 28 year old. Age. And, and we are seeing about uh, you know, uh, like the last six to eight months, we've seen over 65% of our signups coming from tier two and tier three cities. Why is because, again, the level playing field, that concept, I think it's working really well in crypto. Uh, I would like to stop here, uh, but yeah, I can go on and on and not stop. <laughs> I know, and, and uh, we have, initially we have obviously heard you speak in other forums, and I know um, a crypto evangelist. Right? Crypto, I like to think of crypto as the new, of our generation, this is the new wild west, right? Where brave, whoever is brave enough to be become a prospector, Will survive, and the rest of us, uh, the rest of everybody, can sit on the sidelines because it has got enormous benefits and therefore associated enormous risks, depending on how you want to see it, right? Sid, I want to quickly bring you back because one of the things across all of these conversations that we that we we'll see, right, is the expectation of immediate gratification. So while tremendous volume of uh, transactions, expectation is all of them to be instantaneous, right? Yeah. So, and the more this grows, the more digital inclusion there is, 
more and more people will come onto financial platforms, right? So what what sort of role do you and Akamai play in solving the need for this last mile digital connectivity, right? And how do you how is Akamai helping in driving higher digital adoption? Look, uh, you know, as I as I mentioned uh, earlier, right, the, the pandemic has just spurred um, spurred on the, the, the everybody to be online, and everything now is online, right? Everything now is on digital, not just the financial sector across the board. And the significant thing we're seeing in India is, um, you know, and you still mentioned this, and we're seeing it across the board is the tier two, tier three cities, uh, and folks from these tier two, three, tier three cities. Uh, and the traffic that we see on our platform has, you know, kind of increased many, many fold uh, as compared to even, frankly, you know, 18 months ago, right? Uh, it's a significant shift from where it was then to now. And as far as we are concerned, look, you know, in India and globally, we work with, you know, the largest banks, the largest fintech companies. Um, and, you know, particularly after the lockdowns and various uh, things that have happened in the last 18 months, um as i said the traffic just has exploded uh but i still feel that we're just at the tip of the iceberg right uh the main factor is the digital adoption yes you know all sectors are seeing growth but all sectors also are seeing significant upside um think about this right i mean if you depending on whatever report you look at but we're still nowhere close to 100 percent of our population uh, being active internet users, right? Imagine, you know, in the next four or five years, when we get to 900 million or 1 billion people being active internet users, uh, the, the, this particular sector, the fintech sector is going to explode, uh, you know, because every transaction is going to be digital. Today, yes, it's significantly different than where it was two years ago, but now um, when everybody is active on the internet, it's just going to, you know, kind of explode. And hence, users, it, it, uh, to your point, giving a seamless and secure experience, regardless of where I, as a user, I'm connecting from, becomes the most significant, uh, uh, you know, part of a customer experience. And irrespective of whether I'm connecting through a mobile phone, an app, uh, the inter you know, a website uh, uh, on my computer, doesn't matter, right? Um, and then we are at the forefront of helping fintech companies cater to this surge and cater to this, you know, transactions um, increasing and the expectations increasing. Um, and as I said, some of the largest fintech companies in India use us for this end-to-end -end last mile connectivity, including um, accelerating their most critical uh, APIs and also protecting their APIs. Um, look, the, the last two things that I leave you with is that our philosophy, uh, while while a lot of you know competing platforms say that, look, uh, we we have presence in the region or we have presence in the country, our philosophy is slightly different. We believe in being as close as possible to the end user. We believe in having an edge architecture and which is why we are only one hop away from 90% of the world's internet users. And if you come closer to closer to home in India, uh, you know, we have over 300 you know, points of presence. Uh, we have about 18,000 servers located in close to 50 cities. and uh, just last year, we, we served our peak traffic of about 13, 13 terabits per second. And you can imagine the scale that we're talking about. So um, as I said, that's the core philosophy of the platform, staying as close as possible to the end users. And as we see the adoption, and as we see uh, more and more folks getting active, uh, as the internet users increase, we'll get as close as possible to these end users and make sure that you know the experience, irrespective of device, irrespective of network connectivity, um, irrespective of um, you know whether it's an app or a site, uh, is seamless, right? So that's kind of the, uh, the philosophy. I, I think that's the true north, right? Uh, how do we increase experience, uh, uh, seamless connectivity, etc., but keep true to this entire thing? I'm going to go quickly around the table. I'm going to ask you, uh, ask all of us to gaze in the crystal ball in your sectors, in your areas of business, the largest tech plays you think in the future uh, for you and also some of the larger uh, high level challenges that you that you're looking at quickly maybe so we'll we'll, we'll go round robin maybe let's start with Nishchal. Nishchal, what do you think what do you see in the crystal ball for crypto and wasirex and 
the entire technological environment around. Uh, uh, quite a few exciting things, but I think uh, it, it, decentralized finance that's turning out to be a large, uh, uh, you know, area in uh, crypto, and NFTs, the non fungible token, where the entire uh, artist community is getting in and uh, yeah. uh, people who are not into uh, investment but want to get into and be part of crypto i think nfts are for them sort of serves both different uh, uh, sectors and uh, i think what i would hope for and uh, it's it's obvious is regulation in india around crypto which would i think uh, you know help us grow this ecosystem even faster uh, and see a lot more startups because uh, regulation is sort of a dampener for new startups to start up in this sector so yeah that's that's about it. i so the nfts nischal are for are the is the opportunity for people like you and me to own a model day modern day picasso equivalent right? we are never yes, going to yes. be able to buy picasso so, you know that's the that's the only just a chance that we can take shantanu quickly to you what do you think where do you think uh, the future lies in terms of tech and so, your business? so so i'll go slightly more fundamental and i'll say that all of us are here uh, visionaries tech leaders and uh, everyone who is listening to us and i'm pretty sure most of them would be techies or who align with these concepts one thing which and siddharth will hear from akamai will agree uh, more than me with here because this is a term which for sure his uh, akamai uses more oftenly than what i am going to say is this whole concept of earlier we used to say that verify then test everything and now the paradigm shift is moving to which is not that fast it is gradual but we need to move to a place where we say never trust always verify and that is where this whole zero trust paradigm comes and zero trust architecture comes and i actually uh, i've been trying to influence uh, quite a lot in uh, my community my organization my uh, friends that if all of us moves towards this zero trust based architecture trust me uh, uh, the problems which we are talking about for sure they will be really minimized to a level this whole uh, i heard the perimeter concept yes exactly that's where the zero trust uh, talks about you know creating the uh, micro perimeters creating creation of protected surfaces and the micro perimeters falling up with them this uh, you know protected surfaces creating a concept of segmentation gateways this is where i think uh, our technology and implementations need to move absolutely shantanu i think trust. i i i in many ways and i'm not an expert in that field but in many ways i think zero trust is the whole idea is how do you how do you limit the blast radius because things will happen i mean i mean we have to be naive to actually that not just happen. one sentence to add to that uh, and siddharth will again agree with me that now trust is a vulnerability the moment you realize that trust is a vulnerability automatically you will it may sound antithesis here when i am saying this but uh, you know the concept is trust is becoming more and more a vulnerability so how do you take care of that vulnerability by applying a technical concept of zero trust uh, so back to you sujit thank you no uh, i i i totally understand Uh, I'm going to quickly push quickly to you. What is the new frontier in terms of technology and talent as well? I feel uh, you know the the uh, some of the things like you know we talked about the bite size insurance and and uh, uh, the the micro insurances of the uh, that that will eventually get enabled or or pay for uh, use insurance right? Uh, you you talked about uh, motor vehicles when you use it then then only uh, you 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 pay for it that that. That all these things, in in essence, are getting triggered by larger larger availability of the sensor data, IoT devices. Five G revolution will come and bring more data into the play. What will happen with that is that you know the 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 moment of truth of insurance, which which is the claims, that will become more more and more automated. Will be machine learning driven. The the biggest disruption in among all the industries, I feel, will will. will be in the insurance industry where the 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 current uh, claim process which are largely um, semi online would would become completely automated not just online they will become automated and that that will bring about a generation change in the in the insurance industry it it will uh, it will make the project 
products completely digital natives for right from buying to services to to claims and uh, will will like like uh, shantanu said will become zero trust you will you will have enough sensor data to take the decision without believing on something or without taking a like you know uh, without writing something or right, taking a risk the underwriters job will become more and more uh, to to define the rules rather than um, uh, they will be the claims department will become actually a, a data center in the insurance industry and and th that's where the, the 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 a bigger change in in the in in the insurance uh, the whole paradigm that you do not buy insurance it it gets tagged automatically to your buying process you you don't have to claim insurance all by by filling a form or, or anything like that it will become completely automated i i think that's a brilliant thought right and for somebody like me who has this tendency to go about and bank stuff up and do stuff i i think that's going to be a godsend for somebody like me uh, uh, ashish your your two pennies worth sure uh, look my crystal ball says uh, yes we are scratching the tip of the iceberg right now we are just scratching the surface the adoption the digital adoption is just going to uh, grow like n times uh, the innovations that we can bring into our products like what uh, pius mentioned about the insurance it's all again going to multiply in big, big multiple in several times the only issue that we as a country are facing uh, i would say is we are taking security very very lightly so there is an opportunity there is a challenge there is a very big gap and i think uh, as technology leaders as part of the you know founding ecosystem startup community ecosystem it's our responsibility to make sure that security is taken is given as much as priority as what it is when it is comes to a growth for a particular organization so for me uh, and i'm very passionate about this topic so i'll continue to talk only about security so uh, we need to make sure that as much as we scale we need to make sure that we kind of can retain the trust factor uh, just as, as shantanu said by making sure that give security by giving security as much as importance than everything else in your business so I'll just say that uh, ashish i think i think between what you and shantanu said right i think the whole idea is getting our customers and our pa partners and our consumers to trust us by by us not trusting anybody i think that's the that's the holistic approach that we're looking towards this right uh, current uh, i think finally your quick words on what the future holds so i mean when i look at the future i think uh, one thing has become very clear to me over the last uh, two three years i think in the next five years you will see uh, basically in uh, companies of every shape and form becoming lenders in some form that's that's the way i see it i think lending is become, going to become a feature of each and every single thing uh, which is one prediction for me in the future it's not going to be okay lending company and e-commerce company or lending and food delivery company it's just that lending is going to get subsumed into pretty much everything that we do and i think that's a big victory for the real economy system india's i think just jumped the gun on uh, credit cards and i think you're just going to go to this digital invisible credit very similar to insurance it's just going to be available you're not going to realize you're using it and it's going to be baked into everything uh, and one i think a hot trend i think it's i'm two weeks too late to announce it but uh, it's buy now pay later which is uh, i think going to be the short term going to be a lot of euphoria around it it's going to uh, take a lot of uh, new cycles and it's it's a very very interesting thing to come up and yeah. just to kind of uh, play on what shantanu said with bnpl what i'm seeing right now is the exact opposite of don't trust verify it's uh, don't verify is blindly trust all the lenders are just looking customers as just okay i be on to rack up transactions mm -hmm. and i think it's a very short term thing i think uh, in the longer term the players doing bnpl with the right uh, setup are actually going to take the cake at the very end i think absolutely bnpl is the i think final frontier of the convenience economy right? right i go i buy right now i don't pay. i'll then figure out whether i like it and i don't like it how do i take etc right? because all of that happens later and i think brilliant uh, i think it's only right said that we come to you for final view but one of the things that i wanted to actually uh, if 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 you all noticed right when all of you were talking i think one thematic thing that narrative that came out for me is that one of the ways to really scale exponentially is to cut it down into bite size pieces and if you looked at it right this the micro bite size the words that everybody talked about at some point of stuff that also means that uh, the more and more technologies more platforms more partners will have to become a part of a larger ecosystem and therefore the integration needs will just explode right 
and 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 see that's where i think people like you and akamai come in to enable uh, you know clients and partners to be able to manage that without compromising on on the speed to market on the speed of go to market on the ui ux on their uh, you know on their ability to bring products innovative product out said last words from you and then quickly wrap this up in getting eyes from shall you yeah, quickly yeah just i'd like to conclude by saying that i think we're all blessed uh, to be you know uh, in a, in the positions that we are today in terms of where we are as a country and where the digital uh, ecosystem is and the adoption that we're seeing across platforms today you know it's it's fantastic it's the perfect storm um so in summary what i would like to say is that as business and technology leaders data and visibility are kind of great tools uh, that help you kind of strike the right balance between security and user experience right um it is a balance you 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 want to make sure that you get the best user experience but at the same time you win their trust and keep their trust forever and that's the balance you know we we have to find and i think that's the balance that someone like an akamai uh with what we bring to the table can provide um to our partners uh, and our customers so i'd like to end with that and absolutely said i absolutely said i think in kpmg we have this framework for digital success which hinges on three aspects we call it connected powered and trusted right so the idea is the interconnectedness of every part of a business which is technologically amplified capabilities to create and experiment and finally of course underlying everything protection for our assets our data and our consumers right and while we continue to worry about hardware and software we still have to keep the wetware which is you know you me and every other human being we still have to keep the wetware in mind because human in the middle and designing for how machines will interact so when i say machines right i don't just mean physical machines and digital assets i treat as machines right so how machines interact with human uh, is is possibly many a times the difference between success or failure of all these digital journeys nowhere more so than in the financial technologies guys i must tell you something i keep doing a lot of these forums i mean obviously all of you know right this has been one of the most articulate panel i have seen in their subject matter not only articulate but the sort of zeal that you talk about in your own field is just visible palpably visible on screen i mean for example nobody talks about crypto with more enthusiasm than nishal right ashish you can see that the security uh, i mean he is absolutely hung on this and i agree ashish even organizations which are serious about security have a tough time just keeping a breast of all that is happening if you are not serious you don't have a chance in hell of going anywhere but with that i think keeping the person in the middle the human in the middle of designing everything that we do trust on uh, uh, up upstream zero trust uh, oh, sorry trust on downstream zero trust on upstream i'm going to sign off it's been brilliant chatting with you we'll hopefully after the pandemic we'll catch up physically over a drink or a cup of tea take this conversation forward surely thank you so much for having us here let me hand it back to you surely